in the age after the oceans drink proud Atlantis, and before the ascendancy of your noble ancestors, the sons of Arius, there was a time of great wickedness, and darkness haunted the hearts of men. Men had adopted the sickness of tyranny from the Kari, who spread over the earth like locusts. They learned the vice of slavery from foul Acheron, and the dark arts were passed down through the intermarriage with demons in the halls of Hyperborean palaces. Only fragments of noble men, Atlantean tribes lost to the forgetfulness of time, noble Lemurian sailors betrayed by the sea. Only this remained to staunch the Kari advance. Yet through Acheron's haughty reign and Hyperborea's aeon of vices, there was a single people that resisted both the allure of empire and the vice of sorcery. The Zimri were sheltered by mountains on the east and west that met in the north of their country. Here the most noble of the ancient races of men arose, and they remained true to one another. Ever did the persuasive Kari nations attempt to sway the Zimri into their fold, but never did they succeed. For the Zimri had their land, their tongue, and their ways, and needed none other. When words would not woo, the Kari attempted to appropriate the Zimri by war. But the Zimri's fierce loyalty to one another and the difficulty of waging war across the mountains proved a most effective shield wall. Finally, the Hyperboreans attempted seduction by foul demonology. Against this, the Zimri had no defense. At first, at some hidden time, a great and dread god came to the Zimri and made a pact with them that would defend them so long as the Zimri remained loyal to the god in turn. Ages passed. The Kari kingdoms of Acheron, Hyperborea, and Old Stygia were broken and reshaped by the invasion of the Hyborians. Seizing their chance, the Zimri also rushed, rushed upon the dying beast that had once been Acheron. But though they brought back treasure and slaves, they brought back no new land to possess. Seasons passed and language drifted. The children of Zin were now the Zingarans. The Lemurians and the Kari had vanished amongst the Harkonians and the Kishans, and the Zimri land was now Zamara, where the shadows thrive. Zamara, with her raven-haired women, the most alluring dancers in the world. Zamara, with her men of cunning wit and their codes centered on honor and profit. Zamara, with her spider-haunted hills and caverns, the home of dread Zath who watches over all Zamara and catches demons in his webs to devour. The spider god weaves all fates, and is a jealous god that is distrustful of foreign ways. But weak is the resolve of men. It is ever so that when power is promised for the cost of one's soul, there is always someone who thinks they can cheat the devils. Yara, a defrocked priest of Zath, was one such, and the evil he worked in his time was enough to cow men of greater worth and stature. Yet the night the elephant's tower fell, so too did the invisible grip of sorcery upon the ancient land of the Zemri. For one loyal son of Zamara put into action a plan by which he would save the nation, even if to do so he would have to make every noble in Zamara his prisoner. For though Zamarans say that barter is the most holy of Zamoran games. In truth, it is blackmail. And it was by this art that Durle Mok would make every noble in Aranjun his prisoner. Try not to judge him too harshly, my prince. In such dark and evil times, a good man to do good will find that he must do a little evil.